So from the Rhode Island Liberty Coalition and a sometime spokesman for the Tenth Amendment Center during media conferences, please welcome my friend Blake Flippy. Thank you. Thank you, Michael Bolden. So let's talk about the NDAA. You know, I, I kind of have an internal conflict being here. You know, on, on one hand, I'm proud and, and honored that Mike asked me to speak here in front of all you fine people. On the other hand, it, it's, it's something deplorable that has brought me here. It's something no short of the word tyrannical, which has caused me to come here and speak. So on one hand, I'm happy to be here, but it you know, pains me to have to discuss this topic. But I guess that's what this is all about, right? Good comes out of bad all the time. I mean, all of us are here seeking answers to, to respond to federal overreaches. We're here to learn how to fight for our liberties and to take our country back. And, and that is the, the, the beauty of, of what has come out of these federal overreaches is, is citizen empowerment. And, and our desire to, to form a better country and to restore our country. And, and the only way that we will bring our country back is through a restoration of our constitutional ideals. I mean, we really are the restoration we seek right here in this room. What we're learning is the answer. Thank you. States standing up and saying no is the way home. It really is. We can't rely on Congress and the courts. Look what they've done over the past 80 years. I mean, this country is a shell of what it used to be. If you read the Constitution and you read the history behind it, our founders would not even recognize this place. George Washington would be on his horse marching on Washington, D.C. right now. Thank you. And the nullification naysayers, the anti-state right naysayers, they, see, they say that the United States is too dynamic and large for state rights. We need to have one strong central government. But, you, you know, the human experience doesn't change. Our founders had a, a, a neat understanding of history. They were all historians. Many of the problems we face today were faced by Rome. Inflation, overextension, loss of the rule of law. I mean, our founders designed a system that prevented the inherent evil of man from corrupting our society. And we've abandoned that system, and our society has become corrupted. So the way isn't through some far-off political theory from the left. It isn't through more government. I mean, the, the way home is through restoration of our constitutional republic. And, and, and I'm so happy that there is a group called the Tenth Amendment Center, because they get it, and they have the answers. And you know, if, if the founders' principles weren't applicable today, all the problems they foreshadowed, we, we wouldn't be facing. Everything that they spoke about, warned us about, we're facing today because we've abandoned the Constitution. So that's, that's my little intro about, about the Tenth Amendment Center and state nullification. So let's get down to it. Let's get to the NDAA, this terrible, terrible law. I mean, what has happened to us in the last 10 years? I mean, have we forgotten our founders' admonition that if you give up liberty for security, you deserve and will have neither? First, you had the Patriot Act. Completely undermines the Fourth Amendment. Allows the federal government to snoop into our private lives without warrants. Read the Fourth Amendment. That's not allowed. Just two weeks ago, we had H.R. 347 pass. Obama signed it into law. It makes it a felony to have a disruptive protest Anywhere or adjacent to where the Secret Service has a detail. They're the Secret Service. How are we supposed to know where they are? <laughs> it's the truth. All right, so the NDAA. All right, let's get, let's get down to the NDAA. So, you know, there's politicians who get confronted with, you know, why did you authorize the indefinite detention of United States citizens? And they say, no, the NDA doesn't allow that. Either they haven't read the bill, or they don't know what they're talking about. Or they're lying. Or they're lying. So let's break it down. Section 1022 requires the president 
to indefinitely detain members of al-Qaeda, the Taliban, and individuals who have committed belligerent acts against the United States. Section 1022 specifically excludes United States citizens and legal resident aliens. Okay. Section 1021 is the offending provision. Section 1021 authorizes the president to indefinitely detain United States citizens. Section 1022 requires him, but U.S. citizens are excluded from that requirement. It's 1021 which gives him the ability to indefinitely detain us, transfer us to foreign jurisdiction. That's called extraordinary rendition. Yeah, what the king did. And try us in military tribunals. Okay, so the standard. So the, the standard is that if you've substantially supported al-Qaeda, the Taliban, or associated forces, the president can designate you as an enemy combatant. It doesn't exclude the United States or citizens in the United States. As Lindsey Graham, the tough guy from South Carolina, said, the homeland is now part of the battlefield. All right? The homeland is now part of the battlefield. So th th there's significant room for abuse in the Section 1021. What is substantial support? Who are associated forces? And importantly, there's no knowing and willful requirement in that standard. So the president unilaterally determines that you substantially supported Taliban, al-Qaeda, or associated forces, and he can designate you as an enemy combatant. Under the standard, the Florida Flight Flight School trainers who train the 9-11 hijackers, enemy combatants, a fertilizer dealer. I'm a far farmer. I sell fertilizer. If a terrorist buys fertilizer from my family and uses it in a bomb, we're enemy combatants under the NDAA? Yeah. Or someone who donates to a charity which funnels that money to a terrorist organization. Enemy combatant status. Right? Okay, so the president designates you as an enemy combatant, right? So what happens? What are his options? How does he dispose of you? So he disposes of you through indefinite detention without charge or trial pending the cessation of hostilities in this endless law of war, as they've called it. Transfer to foreign jurisdictions or foreign entities. We call that extraordinary rendition. Everyone talks a lot about the indefinite detention. That's terrible. But it specifically authorizes the transfer to foreign jurisdiction or foreign entities for persons the president designates as the enemy combatant completely outside of the United States, completely away from our judicial system, no recourse whatsoever. Yes? Is it true that the... Foreign jurisdictions or foreign entities. Saudi Arabia. Where, where do they send people to get tortured nowadays? Yeah, and, and I would say that a law of Congress, even as one as terrible as this, would trump any international agreements. Not any. Obviously, there's like some constitutional issues with ratifying treaties. But yes, this purports to authorize extraordinary rendition. Or you may be tried in military tribunals. I mean, it's terrible. What happened to the rule of law? What happened to judicial process, civilian judicial process? I mean, this isn't America. This isn't something that should happen in America. It's, it's deplorable. It's absolutely deplorable. And I'll run through the litany of our rights it violates. Your right to seek a habeas corpus. If you're indefinitely detained, the Supreme Court has held that, yeah, you have this habeas corpus rights, but it's, it's, it's a flaccid habeas corpus petition. The only habeas corpus you get, rights you get is that the court needs to prove that the president was justified in determining the substantial support standard. Hearsay evidence comes in. You don't have a right of confrontation against your accusers. And you can be indefinitely detained, not based on a reasonable, beyond a reasonable doubt standard, not a, not a clear and convincing evidence standard, a preponderance of the evidence standard. That is more likely than not, based on hearsay, that you substantially supported a terrorist organization, indefinite detention. Our Supreme Court. Very scary. It's very scary. And you obviously have no rights once you're transferred out of this jurisdiction. I, I don't, I, as a lawyer, I don't see how on earth the courts are able to exercise jurisdiction over you once you've been transferred to some foreign country. I, I don't see it. 
So, Article 3, Section 3 of the Constitution requires that treason be proven by two witnesses to the same act. Gone. Your First Amendment right to seek redress of grievances from your government. Gone. Fourth Amendment right against unreasonable seizures. Now, I submit to you that being transferred to Saudi Arabia without any judicial process is an unreasonable seizure. Gone. Your Fifth Amendment right to be free from charge of infamous crime without indictment by a jury. Where is it? It's not in here. Gone. Your Fifth Amendment right to not be denied due process. Excuse me, denied life or liberty without due process. It's not here anymore. Your Sixth Amendment right to a speedy trial by jury. Not in the NDAA. Your right to counsel. As Lindsey Graham said, shut up. You don't get a lawyer. He said that on the floor of the United States Senate. Screamed it on the floor of the United States Senate. All these people need to go. They just need to go. They need to be voted out. It's terrible what they've done. Not even hearings on it. They didn't even have hearings where they brought witnesses from the public in to testify about this. Passed overwhelmingly. And Obama, Obama, he demanded that this apply to U.S. citizens. The whole time he said that he didn't want it to apply to U.S. citizens, Carl Levin on the floor of the United States Senate declared that, yes, the administration demanded that Section 1021 apply to United States citizens. Hypocrites. Yeah, he said he wouldn't use it. A signing statement that he or his, pre or his successor are not bound by. I do not want... Yeah, I do not want my liberties to be based on the promise of Obama or any person. That is exactly what the Constitution was written to forbid. How can any of our most fundamental constitutional rights be subject to the political whims of one person? It's terrible. It's terrible. So there's still more rights it violates. Let's keep going. Your Sixth Amendment right to confront witnesses. You don't have it. Your Eighth Amendment right to be cruel, free from cruel and unusual punishment. I say this is cruel and unusual punishment. Just my opinion. And your Fourteenth Amendment due process rights. And not to mention all the similar rights which are codified in your state constitutions. We won't name them all, but they're there. So when Michael Bolton calls this kidnapping, I mean, what else do you want to call it? Just because it's the government, it's not kidnapping? They arrest you, indefinitely detain you, or transfer you to a foreign jurisdiction? It's kidnapping. I mean, it's kidnapping. It's, it's no different because our government does it. So an interesting paradigm to, to view this through, uh, other than the evisceration of our most fundamental rights, is that the vague standard that Section 1021 uses, it almost gives the president to, the, the legislative power to draw that line in the sand. You know, what conduct is prohibited, right? So the, the president can unilaterally determine, unilaterally determine what conduct is prohibited. And he can move that line according to the circumstances, that's the legislative authority. He has the executive authority to decide who to go after. And guess what? He has the judicial authority. What your punishment is, he has the jury authority. Can't go to the jury. The president decides to indefinitely detain you or transfer you to a foreign jurisdiction. So what do we call it when one person or one entity has legislative, executive, and judicial power? I, there's a lot of words. They're, none of them are good. None of them are good. Yeah. A what? Exactly. Mono. Monarchy. One man. That's the one I was looking for. Thank you. And that's what we've become in the war on terror in the United States of America. Very, very, very disturbing. I mean, it's sweeping. And they did this. They did this without a congressional declaration of war 
without a proper resolution under the Unconstitutional War Powers Act, it was in a 500-page appropriation bill. Scandalous.